Hello. Now that you've had a chance to read Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey, let's discuss some aspects of this long poem. Obviously, we can't get to every line. Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey is a cornerstone of lyrical ballads, 1798, and then subsequently revised in 1800-1802, landmark text that was meant to revolutionize English poetry with emphasis on natural, rural, ordinary events, but perceived and described through the coloring of especially energetic, active, and gifted imagination. This text, Tintern Abbey, encapsulates many of the core themes of the Romantic movement and does so in a very beautiful text. It is about a visit that Wordsworth, together with his sister Dorothy, undertook to the ruins of a once Catholic cathedral, Tintern Abbey, on the banks of the River Wye. The text gives a specific date to this visit. It is, it is a visit that occurred on July 13th, 1798, and it also is at a specific place. The title, Lines Written a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey on Revisiting the Banks of the Wye During a Tour, is an example of the or is an example of the program, the purpose of poetry that Wordsworth had described that Wordsworth describes in the preface to this text. Spontaneous emotion recollected in tranquility. This was a feeling that he had upon visiting this place, so revisiting, so memory is also going to play a role here. To a natural to a natural site, and it is then recollected. He wrote it down shortly after the visit, a few miles above it. Let's look at some key elements of the text. It's going to talk about a place, a specific time. It's going to talk about memory. Memory for Wordsworth is an important technology or an important uh, aspect of human behavior and cognition that feeds his poetic output and the poetic vision, what the poet sees, that, remember, that grain of sand, which, by the way, also can be the line of poetry. If you can find within the work of art, infinity, an opening, access point into other dimensions, then you are, uh, you are a romantic soul yourself, even if you're just the reader, not only the writer. The text begins in this position, with T Tintern Abbey begins, in a, from a position of return, going back to a place. Five years have passed, five summers, with the length of five long winters. Five, five, five years have passed in 1798 since his previous visit. And the previous visit was one that has remained very vivid for the speaker. He remembers it fondly. It happened when he was a little bit younger. He's not exactly an old man. Uh, he's 28 when he writes this poem. You remember it happened when he was 23, but he describes, he depicts that earlier visit as happening at the end of, during his youth still, when he was still animated by youthful energies and a specific way of, a childlike way of being in the world that has now departed from him with his more mature adult bearing. And the text laments that loss of the youthful capacity for immediate, uh, immediate, uh, excuse me, immediate experience or, um, or sensor, sen or sensory input. But he still remembers what it felt like to be in this place of pristine, natural, sublime beauty. He still remembers the waters rushing past, the cliffs and so on. And he undertakes to describe not only the natural setting, but also what it is to return to it. A few key points. It gives a great deal of natural description, the trees, the sycamores, the water. He can hear it, and he has still seen it, even when he was away from it. There's not much society. There is, the, uh, there is smoke coming up from some hermit living in the woods, houseless woods of some hermit's cave. These are the rural people who are living the truest form of humanity for him, not, in, not alienated from nature, 
not debased in the city, but the solitude gives the hermit, the rural forest dweller, access to access to uh, his access to these natural forms that surround him. How about for the poet? Though absent long, and here's where memory will come into play, though absent long, the, these forms of beauty have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. They haven't been absent. They haven't been gone to me. They aren't invisible to me, as if I were blind. But oft, and here's that recollection of emotion, oft in lonely in rooms and amid the din of towns and cities, when I've been away from nature, when I have been in London, when I have been in the cities, I've owed to these visions that I carry with me in my mind. Hours of weariness, sensation sweet when I'm, things are troubling me in moments of stress and moments of, of tumult. I return here. How does he do so? In his mind. And now he's reflecting on that return as he physically returns to this place, going back to this place that first inspired those sensation sweet. He felt those visions of Tintern Abbey felt it in the blood and felt along the heart of passing into the pure mind with tranquil restoration. There it is. The emotion, what the vision does is it carries him away. It transports him. It feeds his heart. It is the emotion that gives him stability, that gives him strength. Feelings of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as may have had no trivial influence. This poem, which purports to be, seems to be about, about about memory, about nature, is really about memory and the recollection of nature, the recollection of how he feels about being in nature, the recollection of how he felt when, as a younger person being in nature. Those unremembered acts of kindness and of love. This is Wordsworth, the philosopher of, romanticism, of the romantic movement in English romanticism, giving us what he senses, that kind of goodness, the benevolence, the kindness, the love that he reaps from being open to, from observing, from immersing himself in sublime nature. Nor less I trust to them I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed move in which the burden and mystery in which the heavy and weary weight of the world of all this untouchable world is lightened. Being in the world is difficult. Being a person, we don't under the confusion, the confusion of existence, the confusion of other people. For him, there is a gift that lightens that burden, and it is the serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on. It is our feelings that we feed by becoming ourselves, by embracing our humanity, by putting ourselves in these places where we can feel the deep power of joy by seeing into the life of things. Here is that poetic vision. If we allow ourselves, and the poet is someone with an unusual, uncommon ability to do so, as Wordsworth said, Blake said something very similar, we can see into the life of things. And even the life of things that might have been something departed, it's gone, that memory, but he can see into what it is that the world offers us, that life offers us. He's going out to lament. Is it gone? Let's go. Let's through the wood, um, how, he, uh, how he's changed from what he once was. He is not a child anymore. He's lost that innocence, that immediacy, that vividness and vitality of innocent youth. When like a row, when he was almost like those animals that surround the ruined uh, tent abbey, and he went wherever nature left, where he was, he was, the child is an object of nature. And now, more like a man, he lives something else. I cannot paint what then I was. I'm not what I was then. This haunts him, this idea that he's lost some of that vision that is vouchsafed and given to children. That time is past and all its aching joys are now no more. But what does he have? He can reflect on that. He can reflect nostalgically on what was once and reflect on it with greater maturity. That is also part of his poetic vision. And so, not for this faint eye. He's not upset. He's not troubled. He, he notices that loss of childhood, but he doesn't mourn. He doesn't incapacitate or paralyze him for, as he says in a very powerful, 
Beautiful line. Other gifts have followed for such loss. Life, like that river alongside the Tintin Abbey, like the river Y is constantly moving along and almost with a stoic, although there is no sense of emotional remove, there is emotional exuberance, sublime, of, of being overwhelmed, as Wordsworth said, by emotion. But there is a sense that life does move along and it brings other gifts, com comp compensatory elements, a recompense for what is lost, for the loss of our childhood, for the loss of living as we once, the people that we once were, for living in close proximity, the innocence that is lost, that's the idea of the romantic child, the romanticization of childhood, the celebration of childhood. What is then given? Abundant recompense for what is it? It is in perspective. The perspective that can be developed, practiced, and through literature shared with others. I have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, where you are at one with nature, as, as if we are animals running alongside the deer, but hearing oftentimes the still, sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, of ample power to chasten and subdue, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply and diffused, whose dwelling is the light of the setting suns and round the ocean loving air and the blue sky in the mind of man. What do you have? The ability to look, the ability to feel, the ability to think. It is perspective to hear the still sad music of humanity and find it not harsh, not grating, but chastening. It overwhelms one with awe. It silences one, although there are a lot of words here, with a sense of the grandeur of the world, how small we are, and yet how wonderful that we are part of it. I have felt a presence that disturbs me with joy of elevated thoughts that he can think to something bigger than himself, to time, to nature, to existence. A sense sublime. That is what he says. The sublime feeling. He then shares it. And then he turns to his sister, my dearest friend, his companion, Dorothy, who writes in, the, uh, in her own notebooks. His constant companion, Dorothy, who was a writer of great skill herself. Though as a woman, she was not given the full, her full due. And in... And in her, in the Grasmere journals and other and, and other works written by people who follow them, um, you can read about the actual visits. Here is someone a, a predecessor of them who also visited this, who also visited this place. He shares in these closing lines this sense of how he feels and tries to give it to the gift that he feels poetry has given him and tries to share it with her. She is, there's a great deal more that one could say about it, what the role of the sibling. She is sort of the clock, the marker, the mirror to him. The woman, she is the sibling who's known him his entire life and has spent her life with him. And she is the one who could remind him of, as siblings do, of who he once was. Of what, it be, in you I will behold what I was once, my dear sister. And his prayer is that they will always be, as he says, worshippers of nature. When wild ecstasy shall be matured into sober pleasure, when my mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, that's what he seeks to do, to make his mind a place inhabited, filled with beauty. Oh, then, if solitude or fear or pain or grief or those things do come, should be thy portion. If it happens to him, it, happens to, it will happen also to her. With what healing thoughts of these exhortations. May we always remember this day. May we remember the sweet recompense, the sorrow, as well as the joy of remembering our youth. And they can always return to this place, these banks, this day, this vision. How? That is the work of poetry. It is a memory of that emotion. And they will remember that we stood here together just as you and I, whenever you're watching this, are here together appreciating this text, appreciating that feeling that we get from it that is itself stirred by the feeling that Wordsworth and his sister had that 
is not meant to be commercialized. It's not meant to be packaged. It's not meant to be di- is not adi- is not didactically related to us, but it's meant to simply inspire for what the world and what humanity and what life offer existence offers us. That we are all, if we allow ourselves to be, a worshiper of nature. Hither came who came here, and he calls himself still a worshiper of nature, unwearied in that service, and say with warmer love, with far deeper zeal, of holier love, and we will now and no, and we will never forget that after many wanderings, many years, of absence, of separation, of being away from this place, that these woods, these cliffs, and this green pastoral landscape, were to me more dear, both for their, both for themselves and for thy sake. The importance of that scene. Let's turn briefly to another text written by Wordsworth's other companion, his literary collaborator, someone who joined uh, him and his sister Dorothy for years when they were living in what's called the Lake District around Grasmere. And this is Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan here is a visual illustration of the text was written by Coleridge and has a very interesting, complicated uh, preface that one could read about um, taking opium to alleviate some pain that he was in. In Kubla Khan, it also describes a pastoral scene, but here it is a purely imaginary one. It is meant to be exotic. There is the work of Orientalism here, kind of fetishization of what is exotic, what is far away. It is based on an actual scrap of paper, a report from a faraway traveler. And this text, which came from and the, the, the concatenation, the connections are, are somewhat, are, somewhat um, are, are manifold and myriad and complex, but it was inspired by, as he says, a, a dream. The dream itself was enlivened by the opium, the drug that he had taken for his illness, it was the dream was he started to write it down. He tried he, he says in his the preface that he tries to transcribe the dream. He's then interrupted by a visitor coming on a on a local trivial uh, prosaic errand, and this is all that is left: the fragment, a fragment of a dream, a fragment of a vision. But it is also a vision. It's a vision of nature, but it's a nature which is completely imaginary. It is nature in the pleasure dome of Xanadu, where Kublai Khan, this foreign Mongol Asian uh, emperor, decreed to have nature built in a controlled place. Here, nature is not what he seeks to go out, what the poet goes out and immerses himself in, but rather it is in his own controlled space. The pleasure dome is what the is what the emperor decrees, orders, commands to have built and filled with all these elements of beauty and sublime, sometimes terrifying, because sublime can also be not just always positive, but strong emotions. It, it, you can see the, the waterfalls, the chasms, the rivers running underground. There's something both beautiful and terrifying of this pleasure dome with its many forms of flora and hail and ice all mixed together but the pleasure dome is also his head and that's what i want to just mention to you that this place measureless to man that cannot fully be imagined cannot be compassed cannot be measured exists in the mind of the poet the mind of the artist one with that powerful imagination the one given to visions the visions that are here through language shared with others. Twice five miles, it's surrounded by walls in this controlled artificial place of nature where things are even more intense than in, uh, than nature in its, in its natural setting. Oh, that deep romantic chasm. Here's that word romantic. Stirring powerful emotions is what it means here. A savage place, as holy and enchanted as ever beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. The, the, uh, the, the prosody, the rhyme, and the meter leads one on to a sense of unsettled emotion here. 
and from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething as if this earth in fast the pants were breathing. The long and just in that couplet from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething, those long words, those disyllabic long words with long vowels, ceaseless turmoil seething. Also some internal rhyme with the seething sets and the chasm sets you up for as if this earth in fast the pants were breathing. Pants here doesn't mean pants that you put on your body, but the pants of breathing. You're out of breath by the time you get to that line. The prosody contributes to, controls, it almost forces one into what the text is saying. Fast, thick pants, we're breathing. Then you take a breath. This sight, this vision is overwhelming. It is frightening. It takes your breath away. And from it comes forth, let's mix the lips, these unnatural Con um, unnatural combinations of the heat and the cold, the beauty and the terrifying, all of it. Extreme, all of it in extremes, the sublime. Huge fragments, thresher's flail, dancing rocks on the sacred river. Five miles meandering reminds me of the five years. Through wood and dale, the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man. Again, this place cannot actually exist. And that is where Kubla Khan, the emperor who's ordered this, heard ancestral voices prophesying war. This is almost art for art's sake. The shadow dome of pleasure, the beauty and the terror, the power of the imagination is marshaled here to offer a kind of Kubla Khan of language. It was a miracle of rare device. How could this garden, this artificial paradise, be created a miracle of rare device. All the devices of poetry are being used here by Coleridge. It's language. It is the miracle of art that allows for the existence of Kublai Khan. It is a sunny pleasure dome, sun with caves of ice. Let's finish this poem. And then he sees the vision. The poem concludes in its third, its third stanza with a vision. And let's, the vision is of a maid playing music, Mount Abora. It is meant to be somehow exotic. She is singing music that is both pleasing as well as terrifying and haunting. That is what this poem does. Let's come to the end of it. The chasms and so on. And as the poem begins to set, the music continues to ring in his ear. I would, I would build that dome in air. And it has been built in air. It's been built in air, the air of words, the air of language. It's not in any real place. It is in the imagination that this exists. And all who should see them beware and of the flashing eyes, his floating hair. We have a circle around him thrice and close your eyes with holy dread. For he on honey do hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. The romantic vision given to us through these figures is not one of imagine is not one of observation it's not one of science it has taken us beyond observation that we can see with our own eyes that's Coleridge's contribution to it it is Wordsworth would say he's just intensifying what can be observed it is an attempt to take us into the heart of existence of where uh, of where the soul can go Coleridge is an explorer of the imagination. He wants us, he wants to test how far can the human mind, can the human imagination travel and what will it find? He is an intrepid traveler taking us on voyages beyond the ordinary into those most sublime spaces of human art, language, and vision.